back to a fresh episode of Business Beyond the Game. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your host, Eric Jackson. And this week, I'm pumped to present an exciting guest who's pretty busy these days, entrepreneur and investor who leads Mercedes-AMG F1 team as CEO and head of Mercedes-Benz Motorsport, Toto Wolf. Toto, how Hi. are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Are you good? Oh, yeah. I'm great, man. I'm great, for sure. And I know, appreciate you coming on. I know it's a busy time, you know, especially with you know, the Vegas Grand Prix coming up and other races. Um, you know, Toto, you're considered one of the most successful team principals, right, in F1 history. And that success has been good, not just for Mercedes, but F1 overall. And But as you know, you can't rest on your laurels. In your mind, what does F1 need to do to take, you know, the next step, right, Toto, and capitalize on this wave of momentum that we've been seeing? Formula One has been on the way up since a few years now. Um, it it has always been among the strongest global sports because the kind of audiences we attracted over every single season was similar to what the, the soccer world championships or Olympics would gather. But um, during COVID, we, we got a lot of traction because we were one of, one of the very few sports that was actually able to perform and provide entertainment for people that were, uh, were at home, including ourselves. So we were able to race. And then um, the years that follows grew stronger and stronger. Uh, with new younger audiences uh, becoming really hardcore um, and and we just need to uh, carefully expand uh, treasuring what we have and understand why that is and at the end it's all about having great racing drivers in in, in great cars that fight uh, that fight for our world championship absolutely for sure and you know, how vital do you think uh, some level of parity, right, to push the sport further? You know, some analysts have predicted Red Bull's dominance will deter more viewers from tuning in. So here's your thoughts on just, you know, growing that parity across across the, the sport. So, you know, I'm I'm a racer. Fundamentally, this is this is who I am. That's how I'm calibrated. The business side, which we're going to guess talk about, comes second to me. So as a racer, you need to you need to just um, uh you just need to realize somebody has done a very good job and accept that. Like the way we won eight consecutive championships this time, um, it, it's Red Bull. We've won almost every race this season and we just got a game, you know, ramp up our game and respect their performances. So this is a meritocracy. That's how it should be sport. Entertainment for me should follow sport and not the other way around. We're not a scripted show, we're non-scripted. And of course, as a as a fan and looking at it from the business perspective, I'd like to have multiple winners, you know, racing until the very final lap and 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 making it very exciting. But that's not the case this year. Is it going to do Formula One some you know some harm? I don't think so. We provide enough narrative, great stories within the year on and off track, many interesting personalities, and therefore I, I think we will be able to continue to maintain that strong. Um, uh, momentum bearing in mind that nothing comes ever for granted i love that let the entertainment follow the sport right not the other way around i love that um toto hollywood investment is also coming into the fold heavy ryan reynolds michael b jordan rory McElroy, you know have all taken a stake in um alpine for example what do you just think of this high profile investment it says about the league's overall health you know f1's overall I mean, there's always been a um, business side to Formula One and any other sports where you you just buy a stake in the in, in a team, but that wasn't that wasn't really possible in Formula One because um, it has high was always high valuations. There was a lot of investment needed, and in this day and age, if you're part of an investment consortium or, or fund, then you can see many of um, actors or singers or, or or um, elite sports people that invest in a fund and they therefore become part of a consortium investing in a team. And I think, I think it gives us great visibility um, and, and definitely, definitely interesting. Right, in terms of visibility, right? I mean, that, that seems like key, especially we saw with the drive to survive and everything else, right? That has really pushed the sport, definitely. Um, you know, Toto, I'd be remiss not to talk about Las Vegas. It's certainly expected to be one of the one of the for the books, right? Um, Formula One making its debut there. How do you expect this race to compare to Miami and Austin, and you know, in terms of visibility? This year, we since a while actually, um, last three years, we've been sold out at every single venue, which is which is fantastic. Uh, uh, Austin was the single largest U.S. event 
last year with over 440,000 people over three days. And you, you know, you got to pinch yourself and say, you know, how, how amazing is that? Because 10 years ago that no, nobody would have ever dreamt about that success in America. Now Miami was great. Um, an event that was uh, basically started from scratch um, and, and they did a, they did a, great job teetering power problems in the first year but this year was was really a success and now we're going vegas and um that means bigger uh, more um more extravagant uh, i think the, the effort that the city made in letting us race on the strip in the night um is something you need to you know applaud and uh now we're just gonna we're just gonna make it a great show and we at least from the team side we are ready uh, it's going to be interesting to race those cars in the Nevada nights at zero degree. I think uh, Pirelli, our tire supplier, may be sweating a little bit. Uh, <laughs> but in any case, it's going to be it's going to be good entertainment whether those tires grip or not. Uh, and we are really looking forward to it. Um, I've personally never been in Vegas, um, believe it or not. So wow. Yeah, so uh, I'm I'm going to go there like a child in front of a you know toy shop. No, definitely for sure. And, you know, F1 is making a 500 million plus investment in Las Vegas, including putting their own permanent paddock building there. You know, what does this level of investment just tell you, Toto, about F1 seriousness, not just in Vegas, but U.S. overall, right? Three races now here in the States. I think back in the day when uh, when Liberty um, bought the business from Bernie Ecclestone, there was a lot of critical voices saying, ah, is an American media slash investment company really able to understand what Formula One means? Uh, we are European, Asian, and South, South American sport, and, and, and not North America. And they've, you know, they've uh, proved all naysayers that that they actually knew what they were doing. Uh, uh, led by Greg Maffei, um, he brought Chase Carey in. Um, they, you know, they just ran with the ball and run towards the the. Um, the line and they did a great job uh, you know they were they approached it with calmness and say what is it that we need to learn about the sport what is it that we can provide to uh, to the show netflix was an, was an idea that was generated um back in the day all of us didn't really believe in it ferrari and mercedes we didn't participate um i remember my ferrari colleague saying we have to race for a world championship and not do cirque du soleil <laughs> and, um, and therefore, you know, they did they did everything right, and I think we contributed to it as a team's uh, iconic years, um, Red Bull against uh, against Mercedes, and and therefore the investment that they are doing in Las Vegas is remarkable and shows the belief in the long term future of the sport. We want to go back to Las Vegas. We want to provide a better show every single year, and um, and you know, Greg and his team, uh, led by Stefano as a chief executive, they know what they do. And they're prepared to to invest big, and um, that's good. That's good. Do you regret not being a part of Drive to Survive initially? I get the competitive nature, not wanting to, and focusing on what you're there for, right? But as far as exposure and visibility, in hindsight, would you make the same decision? I got to tell you a story, which is quite funny, because I'm a purist. So I'm the one that is always very skeptical if you change the format of the, the race weekend, uh, the different sessions, sprint weekends. But I, I'm also, I think, able to adapt and to learn. So back in the day, uh, Netflix was was the idea. And, and I felt it's just going to distract us. You know, the moment you point cameras on individuals, be it in the garage or on engineers, people are going to start acting. So my decision was we are not doing this. And then Ferrari came along and the guy said to me, what do you think about it? And I said, you know, I, I don't think we should be doing it. Okay, we're not doing it clear. So right. they do all the filming. We are not part of it. I'm on my flight to uh, Australia, first race um, after the first year. And I'm thinking I should be watching this and see what it is, what it is like. And I watched the first episode and the second episode. And it's kind of wasn't so much how I seen the sport and the racing, but great personality stories. But this is how I left it. I come back to Europe after the first race and I have this friend of mine calling me and say, you know, we need, can we have two tickets for the Austrian Grand Prix for my kids? And he said, your sons, they're 18 and 19. They've never asked for a ticket to Formula One. Why would they? And I said, we love Netflix. We love Drive to Survive, and this got me thinking. And then, obviously, today the Netflix guys are part of the show, box to box with us right. for the production. And we we have we have learned to love them and understood that there needs to be personality stories and there needs to be a narrative and and, 
and content. And yeah, I think they've been a big part of us being successful in the United States. Right. No, definitely. It's like you have that moment, the 18 year old, right? It's like loving the sport. And you're like, that's like the the ditto moment, right? Definitely. For sure. Um, that's great. Yeah. And obviously, how pivotal do you think just storytelling, right? You mentioned the personalities, Toto, will be you know, how important just moving forward, right? To sustain the fandom here in the U.S. Um, you know, we have the Brad Pitt movie coming up, for example, and, you know, other content centered around racing. Um, I think what changed since the, the days of um, Bernie Ecclestone is that uh, Liberty uh, allowed us to use uh, social media in the paddock, which, which was obviously today sounds like a no-brainer, but back in the day, content was very limited, rights were very... Um, very limited and we're, we're sold to the traditional linear TV partners. And there were, there, there, that's why the management was protect, protective. And then everything got opened up. We have a lot of young drivers that communicate over the various um, social channels. And that's why our strongest growing audience is between 15 and 35 and a lot of females. Mm -hmm. And in, in order to protect that, we need to remind ourselves that people love people. They need the drama and they need the glory. You don't want to, you know, people don't want to see somebody winning all the time because that, you know, they love the underdog to come up. Come up. It needs the stories of the teams and the people that are not always winning, that are not always at the forefront. It shows all the, the hardship that is necessary uh, to be part of the F1 grid and the fights we have, the political uh, fights for you know, on the, on the track, spotting regulations and all of that together. And I think we need to be aware that, um, you know, that, that the sport that we need to provide, the exciting racing on track, man against machine, team against team, that is the key part of us being successful in the long term. Love that. Love that for sure. And, you know, for Toto, as we wind down here, you know, You've been an investor, driver, executive, you know, you've touched a lot of aspects of the industry. And I'm curious for you, just what's been the best business lesson you've learned during your career? Or one of the best, you would say. I've been 20 years in finance. I've had a little venture capital company and a bit of private equity afterwards, but I've never actually run any anything. I was the one in the board that was you know, uh, annoying, uh, asking the annoying questions and knowing better. Mm -hmm. And then I was parachuted into this Formula One team to run it and be a co-owner of it. And since then, every day is a learning exercise. I have uh, the opportunity to be among a fantastic group of people that are the best in the industry on the engineering side and also, you know, the other what we call supportive roles in, 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 in marketing. And, and, and therefore, you know, I go through this and and enjoy every day being able to develop. I have great um, partners in, in the team with uh, Mercedes run by Ola Kalenius and Jim Radcliffe. Uh, we are each uh, third shareholders and they are sounding, sounding partners and sp uh, sparring partners and that's great. So, but um, one thing that I, that, I, that I learned from the late Nicky Lauda is that you just got to develop every day and uh, not take anything for granted, ask a lot of questions. And that's what I'm trying to do. I love that. Keep learning, right? Even when you've hit a certain level of success, right? I think that's great advice from the boss himself, Toto Wolf. Thank you, sir, for, for taking the time. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching Business Beyond the Game. Toto, thank you, man. Thank you.